Hey everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm very sorry that I have been MIA. Let me give a little bit of a backstory about today's video a little bit. June 2019, I got to participate at Roll on Capitol Hill um, to represent the South Central Pennsylvania chapter of United Spinal. While I was there, I met Dr. Boninger while we were doing hill visit. I got to talking to him and he is part of a clinical research study. What they do is they get people who have quadriplegia and they do brain surgery on them. After, you know, the patient recovers, they end up hooking them up to these machines. The patient then is able to move a robotic arm with their mind. I know it sounds very crazy. I get it. I am very careful when it comes to things giving false hope. I brought this to the attention of Dr. Boninger and he directed me to his TED talk where he addresses this issue, which I will be sure to put that in the description, a link to his TED talk so you can get a better grasp of where he's at from a clinical standpoint. Honestly, that TED talk is what made me want to do this for him. They are currently looking for a participant for this clinical trial. This clinical trial, you have to meet certain criteria, but the number one thing is you need to be a quadriplegic. I wanted to get the perspective of both the patient and the a doctor. I wasn't able to get the type of 100% footage I wanted um, due to time constraints, but you know, it is what it is. You got to work with what you got. What you will be seeing is Nathan, who is the latest participant, um, speak about himself, his story, and what this um, research has done for him and what his enjoyments are with it and, and also maybe some downfalls with it. Um, and you will also then get to meet Dr. Boninger, who is the most humble doctor um, I've probably ever come across. They are very real about it and they are very raw about it. And that's what I appreciate. Um, I don't want things to be fluffed. I don't want to deliver any kind of false hope or anything. I just want people to know that this information is out there and that people could be eligible for this clinical trial. Please watch the whole video if you're able to. I am just the carrier of the information. I'm not here saying that people should or shouldn't do it. It is an opportunity out there that is pretty much, you know, a part-time job and it is something to help further the science and to maybe one day help people in the future. I'm Nathan Copeland. I've been a C5 quadriplegic since I was in a car accident in 2004. When I was in the rehab here in uh, Pittsburgh, they signed me up for a research registry. In 2014, they called me up and said, there's this research study we think you uh, might qualify for. Would you be interested? I was like, okay, what is it? It's for a brain-computer interface uh, study where you'll have implants, motor cortex, and I was going to be the first person, first human to have uh, implants in the sensory cortex to receive stimulation through them to, that would feel like it was coming from my own hand. And they said, do you think you would want to do this? And I was like, yeah, like, that's super cool. So that's what I've been doing since 2014. The word brain surgery sounds terrifying. Was, is it really as terrifying as what you people think? Being honest. Unfortunately, you know, if you're you know, not okay with having brain surgery, this, this kind of thing isn't for you. It's uh, just not possible to get the kind of results without having the kind of implants that actually go into me and I was taken very good care of. It's the kind of thing where I knew I was going to do it no matter what. As soon as they said that I qualified, I didn't worry about too much about, you know, these are the risks of having, you know, brain surgery, which are the same risks of having any surgery. So the surgery is at least, you know, seven hours, you're out of it for the whole day. What kind of support network someone has will be a huge factor that they should consider if they're going to 
you know, think about joining a study like this. Now, the people who are involved with the study, have they become part of pretty much extended family for you? They are basically my family that has family and friends. I've gone to concerts with most of them. Anyone involved has gone above and beyond what would reasonably be considered what their duties are when I am here or someplace with them. Do you feel like this study gave you a sense of community? Yeah, I mean, I've met the people here, I've gone to conferences and met all kinds of people that might have read a paper that was published that I was the subject in and all kinds of stuff and it is like a huge community and they all want to hear what I you know, have to say. A big thing in the disability community is um, when research articles and stuff are posted about people like yourself participating in these clinical trials and these in this type of research and stuff. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, well, that's giving false hope and that's harmful to people, you know, that are newly injured and stuff. What do you say um, to that? I mean, it all depends on where you're getting your information. Like, if you're reading an actual science article, like, I don't, I've never read one and, and thought that was giving false hope um, because those are put out as in, you know, this is research we are doing. Um, but then you read comments or something, like, of people that uh, just kind of jump ahead in time and think, like, just recently I did an interview um, about my thoughts on Elon Musk's Neuralink presentation and that it got posted on Reddit and all the comments were like people jumping into like dystopian future like they're like talking about oh they're going to be able to beam ads directly into your like visual cortex and show you ads and like that's nowhere near um, the kind of stuff you can do. If people want to do this for a cure for themselves, what do you say to that? Not going to happen. It's not a cure? No, it is not a cure. It is cutting edge research of uh, the very beginnings. Like I said, I'm, I'm the first human to have implants in the sensory cortex. Um, I think there is a few more that have since been implanted. Yes, we can control a robot arm to do basic things, but uh, none of it's practical in home. Like it's all run on multiple computers in a lab. It's still got big cables attached to your head. So people who want to be involved have to not necessarily want to walk again, but want to help society. It's, it's all about the future, pushing the science forward. I knew from the beginning it wasn't going to help cure me. I, I, I can't feel anything if I'm not hooked up to the computer and they're stimulating on, you know, one of those electrodes. And even then it's not the same sensations. What was it like for the first time moving a robotic arm? It's awesome. From the start, it's pretty amazing how effort List, it really is to just move a robot arm with your mind. Like you just you go through the every day you have to do training where you watch a computer version of the arm move to targets and then you think along with it and then the computer builds a decoder that associates the part of your brain that were that was active when you were thinking those movements. Were you skeptical at first? I was not skeptical but still amazed at how actually effortless it was. Like I knew it would work, but, and then for the sensation part, so depending on which electrode they stimulate, each one can feel like a, like a different part of my hand. Um, it's usually like the bases of my fingers. And then uh, what the sensation feels like uh, can vary. Um, they're usually like a pressure or a tingle or um, warmth. Uh, sometimes it's like a tapping. People who may be interested in doing this study, what characteristics and whatnot would you describe would be the perfect patient for this? First, you 
really have to be able to accept that this is not a cure for you. While I get to do awesome stuff right now, I'm in the study, the inevitable outcome is I will be explained. Uh, the erase will be removed and I will not do any of these cool th things in the future. But is there compensation for your time and travel and things like that? Yeah, there's a monthly compensation and mileage and tolls. That's another big consideration for someone that wants to or is thinking about joining the study is like if you already have a job, like that compensation and stuff might not be enough to offset quitting a job because this is I come in three days a week um, and then on top of that maybe another day a week they'll come to my house and that's like four hours um, of lab testing and then when I come in I live like an hour and 15 minutes so I have at least that travel both ways so it's one of those things that joining is also a, a large time commitment Final thoughts from my point of view would be, I would do it again. I would do it as many times as I could because it is fun. While I'm not gonna be cured and I'm not gonna have physical abilities restored, or it's still worthwhile. It still gives me a uh, purpose, lets me help push the science board. It's really cool, so they should they should do it if they if they can. So I'm, I'm Mike Boninger, uh, and I am a physician at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC, uh, and I also do research. And the reason that we're talking today is that we have a specific research study um, where we're looking at providing a brain-computer interface to enable someone with a high spinal cord injury uh, to um, uh, control a robotic arm to actually feel things that the robotic arm comes in contact with. Um, and hopefully to increase independence. Uh, we have a research study that is uh, looking to enroll people in this, um, in this experiment. Uh, and the research study involves um, neurosurgery. Um, it involves having um, small chips implanted on the surface of the brain. Uh, and so you might, as you might, and it involves tunnel work. And so as you might expect, it's not easy to find people who are willing to volunteer to push that science forward. We just got a large grant from the National Institutes of Health, uh, and so we have the funds to be able to implant two people over the next four years or so. We've implanted two people already, and I think that you talk to one of them. I think if you talk to both of them, they would tell you that it's one of the best things they've done and most important things they've done, and on some levels, one of the funnest things they've done. Uh, unlike your kind of typical research study, you become part of the research team because we like the people to be with us here in our research laboratory two to three days a week. What would you say, you know, as a provider standpoint, um, the level of care that you will receive? Now, what I can tell you about the hospitalization is that the entire care, the entire research team is there together with the entire care team. Uh, so we, our, our neurosurgeon is a spectacular neurosurgeon named Elizabeth Tyler Cabara, and she takes wonderful care of her patients. And uh, you know, I am there, and so I'm a clinician, and I see the people. And so from the moment um, that they come in the morning where we meet them, instead of having them try to find the OR waiting room beforehand um, to the day they leave the hospital, there's these two care teams. There's one care team that is your standard hospital care team, but they know that this person has volunteered to be part of a really important research study. And so just maybe they get a little extra special care that way. And then there's the presence of all of these additional people who are researchers who are watching out for the person. And so I think that we have that covered. I'll tell you, when Nathan woke up from surgery, you know, the first thing he didn't say was, wow, I'm so glad I did that. What he said was, oh my God, what have I done? Because it's still surgery. Uh, and when you have surgery, you don't feel great afterwards. He got better very quickly every day. And then, you know, within a relatively short period of time, he was already thinking this is a great thing. He's had the opportunity to speak in California and Japan and DC and a couple of other places. We take it very seriously here to say, hey, let's you know, first of all, let's do research that helps people 
today. Yeah. And that's the wheelchair research, but let's also keep our eye on what we would ultimately want. I think that whenever researchers talk about their research, they tend to get excited about it and the possibilities involved. And I worry at, that people look to this experiment, and I still get phone calls all the time saying, hey, I'll volunteer. And then when they find out that they can't take the device home, and they find out that it's really still in the experimental stage, and the research stage, they back away, which I think is fine. Right? If someone wants to join this protocol because they think it's going to help them do more at home, it won't. It might help them come out of their shell. It might help them in the ways we talked about it, helping Nathan with the, it becoming part of a community in science. But when you go home at the end of the day, you're still going to have your spinal cord injury, and this isn't ready for prime time yet. The only way we get there is by having people volunteer. And so I don't want to oversell this. And as a matter of fact, if you're within a year of injury, we won't even accept you to the study. One of our criteria is you have to be more than a year out from injury. This is not a miracle, and there isn't one. The, the way we get to miracles is hard work and great scientists. And the person who we want to volunteer for the study is saying, I'm doing this for other people. Um, I'm doing this for other people so that maybe, you know, some years from now, I, you know, Dr. Bonnetra can sit down across from someone with a spinal cord injury and say, hey, let's talk about this new clinical procedure where we can actually implant something that does help your arms move again that you can use at home that increases function. First of all, I should tell you that the study is multi -sub. There's people in Chicago who are also recruiting in that location. And as a matter of fact, there are a couple people around the country. So if you're not in the Pittsburgh area, we're really hoping you are. But if you're not in the Pittsburgh area and you're thinking about this, you can still reach out to us and we can try to help make a connection for you. It's a one-way contract. If you say, I'm going to come in, I want to learn more about the study, you can change your mind the next day. There's nothing that happens. If you sign a consent form, which is a big part of our process, here are all the risks, here's what happens in the experiment, um, then, and the next day you go home, the fact that you sign that means nothing. That what, what, it, it means that you understood it, but it's no obligation. And so what we, I encourage people to do is take a look at it, meet the team, follow down the path, and then if you decide, no, no problem. Uh, but we're kind of hoping that when you, you, you see the group that's working on it and you hear about the work that they're trying to accomplish and you meet Nathan or talk to Nathan or Jan, that, that that'll encourage people to, to, to take that next step. And in the meantime, reaching out to us and asking questions is the way we'll identify that next person. You know, I try not to overpromise on the research. You know, I've been around spinal cord injury long enough to know that the cure has been promised. You know, it's, we're going to have the cure five years from now. And I've heard that for 30 years. And so we keep maybe getting closer, and I'm careful to not promise a timeline. What I can tell you is that we're learning stuff about how the brain works that is actually helping people today. It's probably helping people with motor problem, motor learning problems more than it's helping people with spinal cord injury. But we are, the, the knowledge we gain is helping.